Um, thank you for coming tonight. We really appreciate your presence here tonight. We know you're going to enjoy uh, our lecture this evening, which will explore the interface of science and faith. And I think you're really going to enjoy our speaker, uh, who has been thinking a lot about the relationship between science and Christian faith for quite a while. Dr. Seth Apathy, uh, thank you for coming uh, all the way from New York to be with us tonight. My name is Mike Weaver. I'm the director of the Bradley Study Center at Virginia Tech. And the Bradley Center is a Christian study center here at Virginia Tech that exists to offer the uh, intellectual resources of the Christian faith in dialogue with other perspectives to address the important questions of our time. And we do that through public lectures and discussion groups for students and faculty and the larger New River Valley community. And I know we have students, faculty, and members of the community here tonight, and so we're really excited about that. There are flyers uh, on the table outside in the auditorium if you want to get more, about, more information about the center. And there were some cards handed out today, but I think we might have run out of those. Um, I'm very pleased that we have partnered with the uh, BioLogos Foundation to bring you this event this evening. BioLogos is a national organization dedicated to helping to build bridges between science and biblical faith and helping Christians and others to engage science in an informed way. And so we have materials about BioLogos on the table outside if uh, you want to learn more as you're on your way out, pick up one of those, uh, one of those flyers. Also, I'd like to make you aware uh, that the Study Center is uh, seeking input from students uh, who are going to be here next year about potential topics for a Veritas Forum next year. Every year, the Veritas Forums are held on dozens of campuses nationwide to bring the Christian faith into dialogue with a host of questions and issues confronting the modern university, and we would love to hear from you about the topics that, mo that most interest you. And so there'll be a meeting at 5.30 on April 25th in the Jamestown Room of Squires in this building, and dinner will be provided for those who sign up. So if you check our website, which is bradleystudycenter.org, you can sign up for that. Uh, if you sign up, we'll provide you with dinner. And I'll send an email out to those who've signed up to make sure that we uh, handle any uh, folks that have dietary restrictions. So um, let us start now, but I'm going to introduce a student who's going to introduce our speaker. Emily Warren is a sophomore at Virginia Tech uh, from Virginia Beach, Virginia. She's majoring in human nutrition, foods, and exercise and she participates in CREW as a campus ministry on tech. So, Emily. Uh, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I want to let you all know that we have a time of Q&A after Dr. Sethapathy's talk. Um, so you'll notice there are microphones at the front of the auditorium. Our speaker enjoys audience interaction, so we encourage you to bring questions later in the evening. Um, you should have received a feedback card as you walked in. Uh, we invite you to fill out the card, hand it back as you leave, and so we can prove events on campus. Um, pens are also outside if you did not bring one. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Praveen Sethapathy, Associate Professor of Biomedical Sciences at Cornell University in New York, where he directs a research laboratory focused on genomics and human disease. He received a Bachelor of the Arts in Computer Science from Cornell University and a PhD in Genomics and Computational Biology from the University of Pennsylvania. He served as a postdoctoral fellow in genomics under the mentorship of Dr. Francis Collins at the National Institute of Health. In 2011, he was selected by Genome Technology as one of the nation's top 25 rising professors in genomics. Dr. Sethapathy has published over 80 articles in leading scientific journals such as Science, Nature Communications, PNAs, and Genome Biology, and has served as a reviewer of over 30 scientific journals. Praveen has been an invited speaker for the Veteras Forum at the college campuses and has served on the advisory council on the AAA's Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion. He currently serves on the board of BioLogos Foundation and is a part of their speakers program called BioLogos Voices. Praveen lives in Ithaca, New York with his wife Rebecca and their three children. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Praveen Sethapathy? <laughs> 
Welcome this evening. Thank you so much for coming. Can everybody hear me? Great. So thank you, Mike and Emily, for uh, that very nice introduction. Um, I'm, I'm sincerely honored to be here and to uh, see this turnout. It's really lovely. Um, I really do mean it when I say that I enjoy the Q&A sessions of these kinds of talks more than anything else. Uh, so please don't feel shy. Um, you know, come up, ask your questions. Um, if for whatever reason you are feeling a bit shy to do that, um, I'll be hanging around for a little bit afterward. Um, so please don't uh, hesitate to come find me and ask me. Um, I'll always also offer, um, if people are not able to continue the conversation with me, but you have questions that you would like to, uh, to ask me or a discussion that you'd like to have with me, just Google me, find me online, send me an email, and I'll do my very best to get back to you in a timely fashion. Okay, so please don't hesitate to do any of that. So I have about 30 minutes this evening um, to introduce myself and to tell you about what makes us human, which you know we've only been wrestling with for a few thousand years, so I'm pretty sure we're gonna figure it all out tonight. But before we do that, a little bit about me. I'm a Christian, a scientist with a, a Hindu background, Indian ancestry, Canadian birth, and American citizenship, right? So, that's kind of a lot to unpack, and obviously I'm not gonna get into most of that um, today. But what's most relevant for today is that as a scientist, I'm firmly committed to the pursuit of empirical knowledge. Right? So that's making observations, gathering tangible data to test my hypotheses. On the other hand, I'm also a person of deep faith in Christ and in truths that I believe science alone cannot illuminate. I've committed my life to both science and faith. They don't occupy separate parts of my brain, and as far as I'm aware, they don't represent multiple personalities. They really do sort of harmoniously commingle as partners. And I'm often asked, you know, why do I endeavor to talk about this topic of science and faith in the academy with students and faculty? Um, but also in the church with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And there are many reasons, actually, but in the interest of time, I thought I would start today by sharing with you just one of these reasons that I think is particularly poignant. And that reason is, simply put, it's a difficult, challenging topic. That's it. And I believe that as such, this makes academia and the church a really appealing forum. Doesn't always feel that way, but it should. A shared theme between my experiences as a scientist and as a follower of Christ is that I never stop learning, right? The moment that I think I've understood something is the moment where my ego has got the better of me. How many of us, right, those of us who are Christian in the audience have opened up the Bible to a very familiar passage that we've perhaps read hundreds of times but because of a new context in our lives or something uh, new that you see God doing, it suddenly provides a fresh new meaning to you. The same has been true for me in science. We've had the human genome sequenced now for almost 20 years, and I've personally stared at some parts of this genome trying to figure out what it does. And just when I think I've figured out how it works, I'll get a new clue and I'll learn that it is far more complicated and multifunctional than I ever originally imagined. The lifeblood of both vibrant science and vibrant faith is the willingness to ask and wrestle with hard questions that don't have pat answers. But to be very honest with you, this was not my experience when I was wrestling with difficult questions at the interface of science and faith as a graduate student. I could not find very many partners in my journey, either at church or in the academy. And I think we should be concerned when the academy and the church get a little too comfortable, a little too relaxed in its ways, because I think this holds us back from making progress in science, making progress as a culture, um, and drawing nearer to God. It can lead to a kind of you know, groupthink mentality that I think is stagnating and unproductive. The former provost of Stanford University, he gave a speech on the academy a little over a year ago in which he made um, a poignant observation. And here's his quote. 
we need to resist the external threats to our mission. But in this, we have many friends outside the university, willing and able to help. But to stem or dial back our own academic parochialism, we're pretty much on our own. The first step is to remind our students and colleagues that those who hold views contrary to one's own are rarely ever evil or stupid, and they may know or understand things that we do not. It is only when we start with this assumption that rational discourse can begin and the winds of freedom can blow. Former provost of Stanford University. My hope and my prayer is that the Bradley Study Center would be committed to and even known by this principle. And I have to say over the course of this day, um, I've been able to interact with the leadership at the Bradley Study Center, uh, some students that are involved with the Bradley Study Center, and I am incredibly encouraged and heartened to see this unit flourishing on this campus in the way that it is, uh, trying to bring back uh, an intellectually rich uh, thinking um, and life to the Christian experience, but also a wider engagement with the university. I'm excited to see what will happen here on campus over the course of the coming years. Historically, science and faith have actually been co-laborers in the pursuit of truth. Some of the greatest thinkers, intellects, and inspirations to many of us in this room were profoundly committed to the idea of harmony between science and faith. And one of my favorite examples is Johannes Kepler, who was driven to science by an insatiable desire to learn about God and celebrate him. You know, many people assume that some of these older thinkers that we bring up, their culture was Christian, they were scientists and just happened to be Christian. But it's actually not so. Many of these thinkers were actually driven to do the scientific work that they did because of their belief in a God of order in principle. The modern notion that deep faith in what cannot be seen is you know, somehow in direct opposition to one's ability to do rigorous study of what can be seen is a fallacy. But nonetheless, there's a widespread sentiment in our nation that science and faith are at odds. And the reason for this perceived conflict is, of course, very complex and multifactorial. But some of the distrust between scientists and people of faith, I believe, can be traced back to a somewhat tortured history of how the Bible has been misused and abused to unnecessarily sort of create this enmity with science. As followers of Christ, we often are fond of saying we have a high view of Scripture. To me, what that means is that I strive to understand what the Bible is and what it isn't. My view, and one that is shared by many theologians and thinkers over the centuries, is that the Bible's primary objective is not to describe the mathematical language or the physical laws or the chemical makeup of the world. Its goal is entirely different to speak of God's interwoven presence in the history of mankind, right? His love, our need for him, eternity, sin, redemption, restoration, these weighty concepts. And the Bible, I believe, communicates these things in incredibly diverse ways. Prose, poetry, song, parables, polemics, rhetoric, observational language. I mean, you name it. Every literary device you can see packed in there. Whatever way will help us best understand who God is, what he's done for us, and why. I too often see the Bible being treated as a scientific text. And I think that's a bit like a robot reading Romeo and Juliet. The words are going to be read out, but the true meaning and effect is very likely to be missed. If we don't prayerfully and respectfully strive to understand the richness of the language and the breadth and the depth of its intended meaning, then I think we're going to be in danger of diminishing the power that those words can have in our lives, or perhaps even worse, misconstruing it and misrepresenting it altogether. So the main question right, on the table today, on the agenda, is what makes us human? And this is a question, obviously, that has challenged not only ancient thinkers and philosophers, but it's something we modern scientists think about quite a bit, too. We are in an era of unprecedented scientific advancement and knowledge 
But I believe that as biologists, we're actually no closer, possibly in some ways further away, to delineating clearly what makes us human, or perhaps put in another way, what makes us unique as a species in this vast sort of tapestry of biological life. Many scientific discoveries in the recent past have actually revealed how difficult, how challenging it can be to definitively establish human uniqueness from a purely scientific or biological standpoint. So the standard approach goes like this, right? We identify biological features of modern humans that appear unique to us, okay? And there have been four major iterations of this approach in the scientific community, each of which I think has provided very important insight about what it means to be human, but ultimately has been dissatisfying in providing a full answer. And I wanna walk through these four iterations with you tonight. The first is behavioral. And often this was lumped together with sort of anatomical and morphological, okay? But these claims have not stood the test of time. Tool making, empathy, cooperation, even trickery, conflict resolution, these have all been suggested by scientists at one point or the other as unique markers of humanity, but since have been identified and even widely appreciated now in many other animals, particularly primates. The more we learn, the fuzzier it seems to get in terms of how we cleanly distinguish ourselves behaviorally from other animals. So as I said, some have tried to define human uniqueness from an anatomical perspective, but this too has proven problematic. For example, it has long been known that humans have asymmetries in our brain that contribute to certain cognitive functions. For many decades, these features were thought to be uniquely human. But an increasing number of recent studies, particularly in the last decade, have revealed that some of these left-right brain asymmetries are actually shared by other vertebrates. Okay, so what if we dig a little deeper? Maybe that was a little too superficial. What if we get to the cellular level? Could we define a human as a collection of human cells? Seems elegant, but there's a problem with this approach. One of the most remarkable discoveries in biology in the last decade is that the human body is home to tens of trillions of microorganisms, predominantly bacteria, but other kinds of microorganisms as well. Tens of trillions. It's a staggering number. If you put it in another way, this is slightly more than half of the cells in a human body are not human at all. These bacteria, they live alongside us, they communicate with our human cells in a variety of different organs, such as the skin or the gut. And it turns out it's not just that they're there, but they're essential for the healthy functioning of some of these organs. The environment around us such as the food we eat or the exposures that we have, they can reshape the bacterial composition of our bodies in predictable ways. And these changes in the bacteria can dramatically alter the way that our human cells work without altering our DNA or our genetics at all. It can even lead to or exacerbate various diseases like diabetes and many types of cancers. So these bacteria, they obliterate this traditional view that a human might be able to be defined by the collection of human cells. We're clearly more than that. Okay, now we're gonna dig even deeper. What about at the genetic level? What if we could just said, what if we defined a human by DNA, the human genome? Believe it or not, here too we face a little bit of a sticky problem. Littered throughout our genome, are genetic elements originally from other species that are completely unlike us. In fact, at least 10%, and this is probably an underestimate, of our human genome represent sequences from viruses that have integrated into our DNA, and subsequently sometimes have been co-opted for different kinds of functions. So even at the genetic level, you could say we are one-tenth virus. And it's not only that, we also have DNA embedded in our genome from closely related species like Neanderthals. And in fact, those of us with European or South Asian ancestry, like myself, have slightly more Neanderthal DNA than those, for example, from Sub-Saharan Africa. 
What do we make of all of this? It certainly should make us extremely cautious about using genetics alone to define humanity. Okay, let's try another approach. Completely different scientific approach that some have tried to use to answer this question of what makes us human, and it's from an evolutionary perspective. Certainly I'm a proponent of biological evolution, but is that going to be sufficient to help us explain um, or, or answer the question what makes us human? One could attempt to determine the exact time point at which human beings emerged, and then we could simply say every organism in that lineage from that time point on is human. It's another way to deal with this question, right? Seems clean, but you know what I'm gonna say. There's a problem here. This approach misunderstands the process of evolution. Trying to determine the exact point at which humans emerged onto the scene is like trying to determine the exact moment in history when modern English appeared. Can we do that? Can we point to a time and say, aha, that's the moment when modern English surfaced? We can't, because languages, like species, change their characteristics slowly over long periods of time in the context of a population. Old English definitely gave rise to modern English. There's no doubt about it. But there's no singular moment in time that we can point to in which that transition happened. The traits of the language changed slowly but surely due to all sorts of dynamic cultural influences, and now we find ourselves speaking modern English. It's precisely this way when it comes to the evolution of a species. There's no singular point at which a human appeared. But human-like traits emerged over a long period of time and gave rise to a modern population of organisms that we now look around and call humans. For those, actually, as an aside here, that are more interested in this topic, there are a series of articles on the BioLogos Foundation website uh, written by Dennis Venema uh, that I think you'll find engaging if you like this topic. You might also consider reading, there's a recently published book, Adam and the Genome, I believe that the uh, Christian Bradley Study Center is going to be doing a study on this um, and written by Dennis Venema and New Testament scholar Scott McKnight. But the bottom line here right, is that it's not so straightforward to define uniqueness of a human with biology or science alone. So where does this leave us? What does my Christian faith have to say about this question? Here we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the book of Genesis, which introduces one of the most powerful and important concepts in Judeo-Christian theology, the imago Dei, or the image of God. During the telling of how the universe came to be, this phrase is used for only one species, human. God makes it clear that he delights in everything he's made, there's purpose in everything he's made, but he sets humans apart, stating that only they are made in his image. This is not a biological distinction from my very best reading of Genesis, but a functional one. The Hebrew word that is used for image in Genesis is the same word used to describe royal images that a king would set up all across his entire kingdom when he could not be physically present. So the image of God can be taken to mean that we are called to represent God and to reflect him on earth. A theologian, Dr. Richard Middleton, um, in Roberts Wesleyan University in Rochester, New York, has written a book called The Liberating Image, in which he's defined the image of God as the royal office or calling of human beings as God's representatives and agents in the world. There's a lot that's been said and written about this topic, and there's more that we want to explore about it in the q and I'm happy to do so. But suffice to say, my reading of Genesis is that what separates us from the rest of creation is less material and more functional. And this is not an uncommon view among many Christian theologians, both now and well before the advent of evolutionary theory. Christianity teaches that humans desire God and relate with him in a unique way. And humans have been given the responsibility to represent God and to contribute to the creative process that he's authored that I believe animals have not. Certainly, the ability to represent God has some biological requirements. It's not divorced from biology. 
It's just that I believe biology is not sufficient to explain it by itself. There's something else to the human, this calling to, to reflect and represent him, that I believe is what ultimately sets us apart from the rest of biological life. But it's not just this calling to reflect him. I think that's part of the equation. There's something else. There's another piece to the puzzle. And there's a psalm, Psalm 104, that I think helps reveal this piece. Most of the verses about creation in Psalm 104, they seem to emphasize the purpose that created entities serve. So the water is to quench the thirst of the wild donkeys. The grass is food for the cattle. The trees are, birds, uh, are for birds to make their nests. The mountains are for the wild goats to make their home, so on and so forth. But one day when I was reading this, one verse really stood out as very different to me. It's verse 26, and it says that the Leviathan, sea monster, was created simply so it could play in the water. That was really remarkable to me. It reminded me that while part of God's wisdom and creation is indeed order and purpose, another part is simply for the fun and the pleasure of it. He takes delight in his Leviathan, it says, which he formed apparently just so it can frolic and take delight in the oceans. Nothing else is provided about the purpose of the Leviathan. I thought that this might color the way that I read the entire psalm, so I went back through it. And then suddenly, the theme of joy, I realized, was woven throughout. The gushing forth of springs in verse 10, the singing of the birds in verse 12, the wine that gladdens the human heart in verse 15, or the oil that makes our faces shine in verse 16. These all suddenly made it clear to me that God makes things not just to satisfy needs like hunger and thirst, right, but also for the pure enjoyment of it. And I think herein lies a core truth of the Christian faith, that at the heart of creation is God's joy. God has been taking immense pleasure in his creation from the very beginning. And mankind, all of us here, we are that part of creation that gets to join him. We get to delight in creation right alongside our creator. We get to peer into what Ephesians 3.10 calls the manifold wisdom of God. It's a quick aside here. If you go to the Greek in Ephesians 3.10, the word that's used there for manifold is polupoikilos. Poikilos means many colored. That's a common word. You might imagine that word being used in the Greek translation of Joseph's uh, multicolored coat, and indeed you'd be right. But Paul actually makes up a word Polupoikilos, right? So polu just means many. So he says many, many, many colored, right? It's like he couldn't control himself. He was just conveying the sense of effusiveness and multi multifaceted nature of God's wisdom. And we get to be a part of exploring that and discovering that and making it known. This is an important aspect of humanity. And I believe it's what the scientific enterprise is at its core, actively drawing near to God's joy in creation. Now, for some of you, it may feel like there's an elephant in the room here that I haven't explicitly acknowledged. In my remarks today so far, hopefully I've made my position clear that biology alone is not sufficient to explain what it means to be human, but at the same time, it is also my position that biological evolution, authored by God, has brought about our biological features that do help position us to act on this calling that's been placed on our lives, this calling to reflect and represent him. For some, this position is confusing because there is a common perception that the randomness that is inherent to the process of biological evolution is somehow opposed to this notion of God's sovereign and purpose-driven direction. So I thought I would be remiss if I did not uh, directly address uh, this misconception. One of the most stunning and paradoxical truths in biology is that apparently random processes lead to ordered, predictable outcomes all the time. 
And this is in part because random processes do not occur in a vacuum. They occur within a specific system, say a cell, and this system defines the boundaries of what can and cannot happen. So that random processes ultimately yield a final product that is more or less reproducible, but you know, with slight variations to allow for diversity. If you're interested, there's a well-written article on this topic on the BioLogos website, authored by Catherine Applegate. It includes some very nice examples of exactly what I just mentioned, random processes in biology yielding predictable, purposeful outcomes. But one of the more compelling examples is the formation of the human body. That is the process by which each of us develops from a single cell to a whole organism. I won't get into the details of this unless, again, if in Q&A people are interested, but inherent to this process is chance and probability. It's been said, in fact, that our cells, that they play dice en route to becoming a fully formed heart cell or lung cell or liver cell. But despite this underlying stochasticity or randomness, at the end of the process, what happens? A human body emerges every time. Of course, each of our human bodies is a little bit different from one another's. I wish mine was a little bit taller. Right? But I think that you'll agree that there is an overwhelming concordance in our features. Right? How does this happen? There was an article published in Nature several years ago that I thought provided a rather poetic answer. If cells play dice, various geometric and temporal constraints on the cells can weight the dice, thus disrupting perfect randomness to convert noise into orchestrated sounds. In other words, even random processes are constrained by the parameters of the system in which they operate. And these constraints actually help shape the final outcome. Randomness, at least the way that we generally think about it in the scientific community, does not imply lack of order or purpose. Instead, they can actually, under operating under specified constraints, can actually weave a beautiful tapestry, like how evolutionary processes bring about the diversity of biological life. So I've made a case this evening that what really makes us human is our calling to reflect the character of God and also to experience deeply the joy of God in creation. But it does beg the question exactly how do we do this? First, we do it by emulating the person of Christ. I've found no better example who the Bible refers to as the image of the invisible God. Christ says, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. And what you do for the least fortunate, you do for me. And it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Sacrifice for others is not something we do when we want to feel good about ourselves. It's what we do when we understand what it really means to be human. Second, we do it by opening our eyes. Opening our eyes to the overabundance, dare I say, prodigal amount of created things all around us. The sheer vastness of the created order and the, the diversity and complexity of created things, it's awe-inspiring if we took a moment to think about it. We are meant, I believe, to exist in this state of awe in a way that I believe no other animal is. But unfortunately, and increasingly, I fear that we too easily assume an overly pragmatic or utilitarian view of the world. But actually, it's all there in part, at least simply, because God enjoys it. And as humans, specifically humans made in his image, we're called to enjoy it too. Thank you very much. So as was mentioned, uh, there are plenty of opportunity for Q&A. Um, th there's, you know, please feel free, don't be shy. Um, you can come up to the front here and use these mics. Um, and um, if you, for some reason, can't hear, I'll uh, be sure to repeat the question. Yes. Dr. Pravian, thank you so much for coming here to Virginia Tech. I appreciate your uh, addressing us on this issue.
Um, I, you mentioned uh, Genesis, you mentioned Luke, and um, I was wondering if you might uh, reflect some on how to hold together Genesis and Luke and Jesus, um, especially uh, with some of the difficulties perhaps that uh, you know I'm going to ask about. So for example, in Luke chapter 3, where we, ask, we find out who is Jesus, and it's traced back to Adam. Mm -hmm. Um, leaving aside the, the genre of the Psalms and Genesis for a second, how, yes. how, might, how might we understand uh, what, what's clearly a historical chapter that begins with the 15th year of Tiberius, Caesar, and so forth, Yes. to, to understand Adam in, in light of this? Yes. Great question, and I love this. Go straight to the hard stuff. I like it. <laughs> um, so there are a few different ways to deal with this, and I think before I even get to explaining those, um, what I want to clarify here is that you know, any position that you hold from a Genesis standpoint or even other points of scripture, there are questions. Any singular, any position that is being held out there in various Christian communities. So I think we all need to recognize that not every answer is provided, right? But it is still our responsibility to wrestle with these positions that we hold and see if they're intellectually tenable. Right? So here are a couple different ways that I and others have thought about that particular question. So in a, in a model of biological evolution, right, our best science right now tells us that um, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, right, there are human beings that emerged, probably a population of roughly around 10,000 or so, okay? Um, and uh, those would be considered the ancestors of all modern day human beings, okay? So how do we reconcile that, is I believe the question, right, with a portion of scripture that I think we can take as historical, right, um, even chronological in, in some parts, okay, how do we reconcile it when it talks about Adam or appears to talk about Adam as a historical entity, right? Actually, the, uh, e e even uh, tracing the name back, it says in genealogy. Sure. So not just mentioning him, but he traces back. Okay. Sure, yep. So the first thing I will say, okay, is that Biological evolution does not condemn the possibility of a historical Adam and Eve, right? So that there were two people who may have been named Adam and Eve that were uh, given as representatives or archetypes of mankind this calling to be made in the image of God that then somehow spread throughout the rest of humanity that were contemporaries of Adam and Eve, but they were somehow selected in some way as representatives, representative heads, is entirely consistent with the notion that there could have been 10,000. Science has nothing to say about that possibility, right? So that's a model that's very plausible. That leads to other questions like exactly how does the image of God spread, right? And I don't think we have satisfying answers to those questions because those are in some ways similar to questions like how does the propitiation of sins by Jesus' death on the cross spread? Exactly what are the mechanisms for that? I'm not sure I could answer that either, but I believe it, right? So I think there could be mechanisms by which a head is chosen, and then something that is then uh, conferred upon those heads is really, the, it's a representation of something conferred upon everything that those heads represent, right? So that's the first thing that I wanna highlight is that a historic Adam and Eve is not implausible when we consider biological evolution as bringing about human beings and all of uh, biodiversity. Right? The second thing I will say, though, to be honest, is that many people who do have the biological evolution, who do hold to biological evolution, some do hold to a historical Adam and Eve, and they don't find any inconsistency there. Others don't. And then your question becomes even more relevant, right? Because then you say, okay, now how do we deal with those sections of Scripture? N.T. Wright has actually written quite a bit about this recently, okay? um, and a number of other theologians as well. You may be familiar with John Walton is another one. Tremper Longman is another one, um, if you're looking for people to go read up on afterward. Um, but, um, and Richard Middleton, whom I mentioned, um, is, is another proponent of this view. But the idea is that Adam and Eve are, are archetypal, right? and while there may be references to them that appear to suggest that they may be human, right? they perhaps were not. So hang with me for a minute here, okay? Does requiring Adam 
to be a historical figure, right, um, is that required for Jesus to make sense? Okay. And the argument by many of these theologians is it does not need to. We can think of him as an archetypal, as a representative right, of humanity rebelling against God and Jesus correcting that. And so it, it doesn't, it, for many theologians, seem to really do violence. But we do have to reckon with the fact that the folks who mentioned Adam do appear to think he's historical, right? But the other thing we need to remember is if they were wrong about that, does that change the veracity or the truth of what the Bible is attempting to communicate in those portions of scripture? I think that's what we need to wrestle with, okay? Um, is yes, the Bible has authority in all things having to do with faith, right? But is it, is it um, to be taken literally? For example, um, there are, it's very specifically stated uh, that the earth has a firmament, right? That, and, and the view of the firmament for many, many centuries was that it was a solid dome, Right? So that as we look up above and it says that the waters were separated, that there was a solid dome and many believed this. And many fervently believed that this is what scripture was saying in Genesis. Right? Um, and uh, also in other parts of scripture. But then it became clear with the advent of science right, and uh, the ability to explore the atmosphere that it was no, there was no solid dome there. And then suddenly John Calvin and others came up with the idea of accommodation that God uses the knowledge we have at the moment in order to communicate the truth that he wishes to communicate, right? So it's this accommodation was the term that was given to this. And then John Calvin, uh, for example, there were others too that said, actually, you know what, maybe the firmament are the clouds. Maybe we can think of it that way, right? But it didn't really matter how you thought of it. What mattered is that that wasn't really the point. There was something else, some other more important, more salient truth that was being communicated in those verses. Right? Ultimately, at the end of the day, I think if, you know, probably the safest bet is to think, well, may, maybe there was a representative historical couple, right? Um, but a lot of argument is being made for the idea that even if it's stated as such, if they happen to be wrong about that, it doesn't necessarily change the truth being communicated there. In the same way that Paul thought Christ was coming imminently, right? So that, that appears pretty clear throughout his writings, and yet he didn't. But does that really change if Paul was wrong about that? Does that change the veracity of the teaching that he exposited or uh, the things that he wrote down about who Christ is and why we should follow him? No, right? So I think uh, th th some potentially helpful ways to think about it, but I appreciate that there's no definitive answer, and I don't want to act like there is one or that I have one. Yeah, so. I think in some ways it would take more faith for me to adopt that position because of the very nuanced way that Genesis is written, right? So that, that really is the beginning, right, of wh where creation is supposed to have taken place, right? That's the story right there. Um, and that's probably where it says more about that family, that first family, than perhaps anywhere else, right? And so I would want to lean pretty heavily on that. And as I do that, I find it extremely difficult to be able to adopt the position for numerous reasons that I could get into. For example, um, the way that Adam is referred to, right? Um, it's often either with or without a definite article in the Hebrew, right? And it's not really until Genesis 5. Okay, so you have to think about this in the Hebrew and not in the way that maybe your English Bibles are translated today. Um, but it's not really until Genesis 5 that it actually appears to be the name of a specific person as opposed to mankind, right? Furthermore, in Genesis 2, right, the order of creation is 
entirely distinct from Genesis 1, but more to the point, in Genesis 2, which is what we tend to cling to when we want to think about a unique single individual man and woman, it's only when we retroject Genesis 2 back to Genesis 1 do we then say that that too is talking about a single man and woman. In fact, just relying on the text alone for what it's worth, it appears to be referring to a population. Every day is a population, plural, of birds filling the sky and livestock filling the earth. And then suddenly, when it comes to humans, we somehow want to interpret it as singular, retrojecting the way that it talks about Adam and Eve in Genesis 2. When in fact, taking the text at its words, most Old Testament scholars would say, the best evidence suggests that this is plural, right? That this is many different individuals. Um, so, and there are a lot of textual clues like that that actually lead me to suggest that, 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 that there's very little to walk away from Genesis feeling like there's biological discontinuity from humans and other animals. In fact, I see remarkable biological uh, continuity, right? The notion that, you know, we are um, a living soul, that's applied to animals and humans. Nefesh haya, right? The notion that we are from the ground and the dust, humans and animals, right? The only thing that sets us apart is the image of God, which I talked about, of course. But I guess my answer to that question would be that I've got to take the Bible as a whole, and the Bible as a whole is not uniform to me in the teaching of exactly how to think about that. Yep. Uh, yeah, I was just curious. Um, as far as you're talking about Adam and Eve as being more of archetypal, or playing archetypal roles, um, if that is the case, then where do you draw the line in the sand where that archetype stops and where we start taking Genesis as like the actual physical word of the 100% honest truth and being symbolic? Like where is that? How do you juggle that? So I, I'm gonna push back a little bit on the distinction you're making between symbolic and 100% actual truth, right? So Jesus says, it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. He is speaking truth, but that is pure symbolism, right? Right, okay, I guess maybe a better wording of that question would be, uh, how do we distinguish between uh, symbolism through mm -hmm. the characters that we see in Genesis Good. and um, factual people, uh, distinct people that existed? Yeah, okay, great. So um, that's a difficult question. Right? And I think it's one that we need to wrestle with as a community. I can tell you that probably the extremes are wrong. Right? So the idea that everything needs to be taken at face value and God doesn't speak in any, non, in any symbolic way, and the other spectrum being, hey, this is all just a story. Right? So I'm very confident both are wrong. Right? And the reason why I'm confident about that is not because it makes me feel better. Right? A reason why I'm confident about that is because, again, as I take the Bible as a whole, Right? What I find is that there are many literary devices being used throughout. And if I appreciate those literary devices, then what I come to understand is that taking the Bible literally means actually understanding something about what the author was trying to teach me as opposed to taking it at face value. So when I think of taking the Bible literally, I often tell people, I do. But, but for me, what that means is I'm trying to understand what the author is trying to communicate to me. What is the truth that's trying to be communicated to me? And for that, I think it, there's no formula and there's no quick answer. We need to take the Bible and the, the different books that we read, and there have been a lot of scholarly work that has been done on studying the Bible and understanding the literary devices, the uh, cultural context in which they were written by very faithful Orthodox Bible-believing Christians, right? A lot of scholarly work has been done. And what you find when you dig into that scholarly work, or at least what I've found, right, is that some of these sections are far more nuanced and they'll point out certain literary devices that are being used that, for example, I completely miss in the English. When we go back and read it in the Hebrew and the Greek, we realize this is an incredible poem, right? And there are some parts of the Bible that are more obvious than others in terms of when it's symbolic or literal, right? So when you have a chronological account of something, which is why I think the genealogy question is a very important and fair one, okay? But when you have a chronological, time-wise account of how something happened, you can be fairly confident that that is a historical record, right? On Friday, this happened, and on Saturday, that happened doesn't sound like symbolic language, right? 
But there are all sorts of other devices you can use when talking or writing that uh, scholars have said in that culture that was very symbolic writing. That was not meant to be taken at face value. And the, the readers of that time would not have understood that as a face value statement. And then we take our 20th century modern sensibilities and apply it to that and say, that's a scientific statement, when in fact it was never intended to be taken that way. But at the end of the day, though, the, the, the answer is that it, it's, a, it's a slow process. And we need to wrestle with it together as a community and challenge one another and sharpen one another about what it really meant. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Can I just say a quick example to that? You know, it's the, the, the really nice example in a science context, kind of bringing it back to that, is the church's reaction to Galileo, right? There were parts of scripture that the church held so tightly to, at, to, to be taken at face value that they viewed Galileo as a heretic for, as a heretic for his uh, um, clearly now well-confirmed scientific ideas, right? Now we look back and we say, oh my goodness, I can't believe we took that position as a church that's clearly observational language, right? We just have to be humble enough to see where we might be making mistakes like that today. But that's all. Yeah, please. In Catholic theology, we are 100% with every single thing you've said tonight and said very beautifully. Thank you. Um, the hardest question we seem to be dealing with, I'd love to hear your thoughts about, if the, since the universe is 14 and a half billion years old and our planet is four and a half billion years old, it raises the obvious philosophical, theological question, why do you think God waited so long to bring us about? Yep. Every time, I, and every time I wrestle with that question, I then ask myself, why is sanctification of my soul taking so long? <laughs> right? And I don't know if any of you have asked that same question, but um, God seems to really enjoy doing things in the process. And I think I, I want to link my answer back to joy in creation that I talked about. It's a little bit hard for us to understand because God is outside of time. Time is actually a created thing, you know. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how God interfaces with those things, but I think there's something about the process of something rather than the end result, right, that God seems to really enjoy and revel in. That's what John Hout says at Georgetown, that an infinite God could not fully reveal himself all at once into a finite universe. Mm. Is that what you're saying? I, I don't know that I would use the words he could not. I, I think I, I don't want to, God can do whatever he wants, um, and it's not up to me, but I might, I might change it a little bit to say, maybe it makes sense to think about God revealing himself that way because of just how polupoikilos uh, his wisdom is. Uh, hi, so first of all, I want to say thank you for the talk. Um, it thank was great. Uh, definitely raised a lot of good points. Um, so there are a couple of things I, I had questions about, but I'm just going to just raise one in a, in a practical case. So just before I begin, could you reiterate for me just very quickly um, what it is to be human to you? Again, just very quickly. Yeah, so the two principles I'm bringing out here are to reflect and represent God. So reflect the character of God and represent him, right? which then immediately uh, requires us to dig into what the most salient uh, features and character of God are that we are to represent. And then two, to recognize our role in joy, right? That, that, that he revels in what he's made and that he calls us to revel in it through exploration and discovery. Right, so, and then another question I have is, do you think, you know, um, being human gives us like more moral value um, than say like an animal or something like that? Do you agree with that view? It depends on what we um, mean by moral value, right? So I think uh, a, lo so a lot like of these questions So it would be more wrong to kill a human than it would be to like... Yes. To, yeah, so, you, so you think that's the case then, right? Yes. So my question is then, say you take a case like Baby Teresa. I don't know if you've heard of the case of Baby Teresa. Um, it was a case so. a little while back. Um, I don't remember the exact specifics, but it's something to do with she was born, I think, without parts of her brainstem, without the whole brainstem. Mm -hmm. So it seems like she never had the potential. She could not currently, nor could she ever have the potential to meet those requirements he set, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems like there are many cases like that. Mm -hmm. So the whole controversy where was, there was that her parents wanted to, so it seemed like she was not even really, you know, alive in some senses, but um, many people thought she was alive, and the controversy was that her parents wanted to donate her organs to children who could use them to save their lives, and or doctors could use them to save children's lives, um, but people didn't allow it because they felt that, you know, she was alive, she was human, you can't do that, right? Yeah. So my question to you is then, 
you know, it seems like she didn't meet your requirements to be human, and it seems like there are other cases that could be raised where they don't meet your requirements to be human, and therefore they sh maybe shouldn't have the same moral value. So what would you say in cases like that? Yeah, in cases like that, what I would say is I think we should not apply hubris, given our current state of knowledge, to know whether or not right, she is able in some way, shape, or form to reflect or represent God. So I, I don't think that we can encapsulate, that I can define right, a circle of all the ways that we can reflect and represent God, right, and then say, that's it. So if you don't fit in that circle, you're out. Um, I think it's an ever-expanding circle as we learn more and more about how, being a human being, you can, in those cases, would I be able to define exactly how, what capacities she would have to be able to reflect and represent God? Um, maybe not, I don't know about the specific circumstance, but I would not feel comfortable saying she could not, right? I can't say the opposite either, that maybe there are ways in which she still can reflect and represent God. Well, I would say there are some ways because it seems that she has less capacities and less features than some animals that you say don't have that value. So it seems that then she would fall. This is where category. I feel like we end up, we end up um, uh, holding too tightly to the biology, right? So what, what I, what I, the way that I try to frame it is to say that for the most common kinds of reflecting and representing of God, there are biological requirements. But ultimately, on a human being is placed a calling, which I think is non-biological, right? So are there unique and creative and interesting ways that I don't know how to articulate that such a human would be able to reflect and represent him? Um, because I don't know the answer to that, and it's certainly feasible and possible for God, I want it, that, that's the position that I would be most comfortable taking. The reason I, I bring this up is because you say almost with certainty that animals wouldn't have this, right? So to me, that seems, like if you're saying that you can't define that in such a way that you could you know, comfortably say maybe Teresa is not human, right? Yeah. Then it seems to me, if you can't comfortably define it in that sense, then you shouldn't be able to comfortably define it that animals also don't have So that, I don't right? define that from a biological sense. But so from, from a scientific from sense, there's no way that I could make that claim. The only thing that allows me to make that claim is my reading of Genesis, which requires me to buy in to uh, you know, the, the entire trajectory of the Christian faith, right. right? And so once I subscribe, once I say, this makes sense to me, the other elements that you know, I don't know quite how to articulate or understand, I have to simply go to the text to say what distinguishes humans from non-humans in the text, and this calling or this uh, um, 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 you know, the, the reflecting or representing God seems to be the only thing that I can see that really shows sort of sets apart humanity. And honestly, my reading of it is not, it's not intended to immediately make animals inferior. That's never to me been the appropriate reading of Genesis. Um, to me, it's to give responsibility to the human to actually be good stewards of those animals and all of the rest of creation, right? Is that we do have that responsibility in a way that I would not ask of my dog. Yeah, yeah do you, you're welcome. Hi, uh, thank, thank you for you. a great talk. I have a quick comment and then a question. Uh, my comment is many uh, academically minded Christians I know who uh, agree with you that physical evolution is a very gradual incremental process, but are also compelled to believe in historical Adam and Eve. Uh, one way that you can reconcile that for those who are interested is you believe that the physical body of the human was gradually evolved, but then the singular entrance of humanity was in the supernatural imparting of a soul and the consciousness and conscience that come with the soul uh, into that physical scaffold. So there, there is a way for those who are interested that do reconcile kind of both of those things uh, together. So that, that's what I meant to communicate. If I didn't articulate that as nicely as you just did, I apologize. Okay, but yes. I, I couldn't get a sense from how yeah. you were saying it, whether or not there was a, uh, a immaterial component to a human. No, yeah, so uh, well, what you just articulated is the way that I would say it with maybe one slight distinction, and it's a minor point, but it's one that theologians have made to be repeatedly, so I thought I would just uh, you know, uh, put you through the ringer as well. But. Um, Soul is actually a really tricky word, mm -hmm. right? And this nefesh uh, that came up earlier, nefesh chaya, has sometimes been translated as soul. And that is often applied to animals as it is to humans. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's often taken to mean something like a living spirit, right, a living organism. So again, even soul doesn't quite do it for me. I think it is really this image of God business, right? This, this calling for, to a certain responsibility and function that I think ultimately separates us, but materially, biologically, I think there's 
continuity with other species. Sure. Yeah. Uh, my question was, uh, John Lennox and many other uh, Christians I know, uh, and John Lennox's books in particular, he looks at the probability of making like the first minimal cell uh, before which you can't have evolution in the first place, right? Yeah, yeah. And he, he says that, okay, even the simplest cell, you have to have enough genes to code proteins. And even the simplest protein requires uh, the 20 different kinds of amino acids to be in the right order for at least 100 amino acids long of a chain. Mm -hmm. And so he says very crudely, the probability of that is like roughly one to the 20 to the 100th power, right. which is also just 10 to the 120th power, which is basically vanishingly small. So uh, does the biologus, uh, biologos uh, belief uh, uh, adhere to this, the special creation of the first cells, or do you think that cells them, even cells themselves were inevitable given the conditions of like the Big Bang and the, the initial universe? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and it's not one that we have at Biologos Foundation an official formal position on. Um, and even thinking through some people that speak for that organization, I would say there's probably a diversity of opinion on that. Um, um, but maybe just as a function of not having thought as much about that as some of the other questions uh, that have arisen in this space. Um, there, there is an emerging, uh, some chemists would argue with me it's not emerging, it's been around for a while, but it's emerging as a larger field that other people are more aware about, and that's chemical evolution, right? So we've been talking about biological evolution, but there's also chemical evolution. And how does that interface with biological evolution? What's really going on there is, I think, a very open area for research. I would be careful um, to enter into a God of the gaps type of thing where we say, since we don't know so much about that, we're gonna say that perhaps there was special creation of a cell. Um, I'm open to those possibilities, but um, I think right now there's more research to be done to understand that from a natural standpoint. Sure, but yeah. given the small odds just on the face of it, we could also in the opposite direction risk a science of the gaps, right? So I think it can go either way. And maybe, like you said, it could be an open question for now. Yeah, it can be, although I'll, I'll just leave it at uh, odds is a tricky game, mm -hmm. right? Because as I said- it's, it's based off the assumptions and the assumptions are still kind of in development. Exactly, right? So, yeah, thank, up for thank you. Yep. Uh, yes, uh, the way you described Genesis 2, how you cannot see like Genesis, Genesis 1 in the same way you see Genesis 2. Um, I would, I would, I'm curious like now that we've mentioned that because Part of Genesis 2 talks about the creation of woman, mm -hmm. which is different than the creation of man, mm -hmm. because she's made out of the rib. Mm -hmm. And the one theory we had where I think you said there was about, if you look at it just in Genesis 1, you could say there's a population of people that are existing. Mm -hmm. Well, with the population of people existing, were they all male and they still needed a woman? Or that, that you know, the what population, I'm saying? Well, because the word that's used in Genesis 1 is a word that's often used to refer to all of mankind, right? Human beings, yes. right? So there, there's no gender association with that term, yes. even though some translations may do it that way. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think it requires not thinking about it. It's the same way that when it talks about birds were created for the sky or the, presumably birds and livestock and all the other creation were created in Genesis 1 in a manner that is mm -hmm. consistent with reproduction, right? But like regardless so. if there was 10,000 males, mm -hmm. we still have Genesis, Genesis 2, which is the catalyst of a lineage for Jesus. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see how the fact that there's possibly 10,000 other people like has a problem with that. Is that what you were arguing? N no, no, no. What I was saying is that oftentimes Genesis 1 gets interpreted. Yeah. The only point I was making in that context was that often Genesis 1 is interpreted as a singular man and woman, but that's only because we retroject of course, yeah. Genesis 2 back to Genesis 1. If you read Genesis 1 in its context, it appears that it's most the, 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 the most likely scenario in terms of what it's saying is that it's a population, just like we have no problem believing that it was a population of birds that it says that it made. And I'm not arguing that it says that it made it instantaneously, yeah. anything like that. Um, just that I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a device that's being used to say that different types of biological life are occupying different spaces. And that's really all that I think Genesis 1 is saying at the end of the day. Um, even with regard to Genesis 2, um, probably the better translation for the word that we often think about as rib is side. Yeah, I, was, I would right. love to do Hebrew if you know it on that portion. Yeah, and so it, th there's a lot of really good commentary that's yeah. out there. One, one, one individual that you might enjoy reading about, his name's John Walton. Okay. Um, he's written a book called The Lost World of Genesis 1 um, and The Lost World of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. And um, it may be particularly valuable for people because he's somewhat agnostic when it comes to all of these kinds of, well, how does evolution fit in and things like that. He's more concerned 
about the most faithful interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2 in an ancient Near East context. Um, and is an Old Testament scholar at Wheaton College. Um, and he's written a lot about this that I think you'd really enjoy. All right, thank you. Hi, um, so I'm, I have kind of a more a biological based question. Okay. Um, uh, so I'm really interested in the whole concept of the soul in general, mm -hmm. um, that I find the idea of the soul really interesting because it's something that's not just specific to Christianity, that so many religions that based from so many different points of the world, they have this kind of concept of soul and um, kind of like our perception of how we view the world through our bodies, mm -hmm. um, that like that this has come up in so many different places in the world. Um, and that I find this really interesting because um, like when you look at us as human beings biologically, um, that from how like my understanding works of it, I'm, I want to see if you can fill in any gaps of that, mm -hmm. but that we're very complex machines when you break it down, that like our DNA contains information, that all diff the different parts of our body contain um, different functions, functionalities, and that we're incredibly so complex, um, and that when you look at like robotics these days, it's nothing near that what we are. But that, like, we're starting to do things with molecular machines, with different, um, mm -hmm. like, that we could potentially reach that way with the machines we're building, um, like, the complexity of a human body. Um, so I'm really kind of interested in the idea of the soul and how that gives us perspective. Like, what makes my perspective that I'm seeing things through my body and my eyes different than you, that I'm not seeing what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, mm -hmm. um, but that like the idea of the soul really kind of encompasses this question amongst so many different people across the world. Mm -hmm. I'm curious on your thoughts about that. Yeah, the idea of a soul is really fascinating because of how it reappears in so many different traditions throughout history, right? Um, and, and I share that fascination with you, but it also makes it extremely difficult because you can find about 30 different definitions for soul, right? So the reality is that it seems to be this word that we're using for something somewhat nebulous and difficult to pin down, right? Something uh, non-material, right? Um, but that we don't quite have a handle on exactly what it is or what capacity uh, it provides for us, and so we use our cultural context to end up defining it in some way, but that is ultimately dissatisfying, right? All of these different definitions of it. For me, fundamentally, I, I, I think it's a little bit, um, challenging to keep using the word soul precisely because oftentimes nefesh haya is uh, often translated as soul, and that's applied to animals too. So it's not really something that I think we ought to be wrestling with um, as being distinctive from other human or other animals. But I think when cultures or peoples are struggling with, but there's something, what, what is this soul that they're referring to? I think a shared theme across these cultures, at least in my study, is this looking upward, right? Like, looking for something beyond ourselves, mm -hmm. right? That, that is a sh that's a shared theme across human, different human cultures um, that, um, as far as I understand, animals don't do, okay? But um, that may be um, a way to kind of think about what cultures are really thinking about as soul. And if that's the case, then I think there's very little that our biology has to say about it, right? We are definitely complex beings, but I'll tell you, if you spend a semester studying a virus, you will walk away shamed, right, at the complexity of this organism relative to some aspects of our biology, right? So a lot of equally evolved uh, species are unbelievably complex in what they can do, right? So I'd be hesitant to, us, to sort of relate biological complexity or our perception of that to whatever, however we're defining a soul. Mm -hmm. Yes, hi. I'd like to perform a little thought experiment with you. Do you mind doing a thought experiment? You know, sure. Don't can experiment. I hope you have good imagination. It's going to require a lot of imagination. Do you have a good imagination? I'll try. Okay. So here's a thought. I have to, I have to set it up a little bit. So do you know Marty Wells at Cornell? Marty I, Wells, I the head of biostatistics and biological statistics. I know statistics. of Marty. Yes, I don't know Yeah, anymore. Marty's a buddy of mine. I was up at Cornell 30 years, and uh, he's a great statistician, head of two different departments, and uh, doesn't believe in evolution. He's a believer. Now, here's the thought experiment. I've got to set it up. Supposing within the next six months, Marty comes up with some proof that macroevolution cannot happen, that, that there, there's no generation of new information can't happen by random processes. This is, you, got, you have to have imagine. Imagine this happen. 
and imagine it gets it published in Nature and Science and mm -hmm. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And all biologists accept it. And I'm not saying it's happened or it ever will happen, but I'm going to imagine it did happen, mm -hmm. okay? So in a year from now, you find that evolution, nobody believes it anymore. You don't even believe it anymore, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. How would that change? Here's the th experiment now. How would that change things that you do? What results that you've gotten, what procedures that you use would be voided because of that? Hmm. That's very interesting. Um, almost everything. Um, yeah, so I, I will be. I will be. I will be. Um, I don't about specific results, but I think methodologies, right? Things that we do to get to the results. I'm getting to it. <laughs> so one of the things, one of the assumptions that we make um, because of the, and, and by the way, I should also say um, that is going to take quite a bit of imagination. And I'm trying very, very hard for you. Um, but it's going to take quite a bit of imagination in part because one would need to reconcile that with, ep with, with, with evidence for speciation that we can actually directly experimentally demonstrate. So a theoretical proof for something for, that's contrary to something empirical already observed is going to be really difficult to reconcile. My understanding but, that all speciation that we've observed comes from the loss of information, not gain. Nope, not necessarily at all whatsoever. So I'll tell you about a, another actual experiment, not a thought one, that was done a little while ago with Drosophila that I think has been really illuminating on that topic, and it's actually gain of information. But uh, to go back to the original question, um, you know, we, there are certain processes that we know are fundamental, that I know in my discipline are fundamental um, to how mutations are brought about um, and spread in, um, uh, um, in a population, right, in a particular species. Um, and it's no magic that uh, microevolution goes to macroevolution. It's the same processes, right? It's just mutations that are spreading in accordance with a number of different genetic forces acting upon them in a population, okay? Um, when we compare, right, the, uh, when we look at the human genome, right, and uh, we, what we often do is we find that there are, in the human genome, regions where viruses have integrated, okay? And we're a, genomics, we're a genomics lab. We're often looking at the human genome, and we can read out the human genome and find all these viruses littered in there. Okay. One of the mechanisms that these ancient sequences have is something called jumping around, right? So they can cut out pieces of themselves and then reinsert somewhere else. And you can imagine if it reinserts in a position that's really integral, like a really important gene and it screws up that locus, it could be very problematic for us, right? So this is a means by which this particular organism maintains its viability while wreaking havoc on its host, okay? One thing we've evolved to deal with this, okay, is, um, or I'll just say we have, to avoid that word for the sake of this answer, okay, is that we have a mechanism to actually truncate these sequences so that, yes, they can insert, but then that's it. They can no longer, they no longer have the capacity to keep doing this, right? So it's an attempt to mitigate this foreign material from overtaking us, okay? What we can actually see is that this material, not just the integrated material, but the truncated forms of it, okay, are littered across the genome, and if you took a chimpanzee genome, okay, you would find that the vast majority of locations where the truncated versions of these sequences exist are the same, okay? So now you have to imagine, first of all, there are, say, tens of thousands of these events across the genome, right? And we have the same, almost the same tens of thousands across the chimpanzee genome. And we know that these come about through integration of events from viruses, okay? So now the probability, so we have two options. One option is that the majority of these occurred in a common ancestor and has been retained in chimpanzees and humans. Another option is that these were independent events, right? 10,000 independent events that then went through truncation events and reinserted themselves in the exact same position, one out of three billion, in the human genome. 
We were talking about probability before. This is going to be an incalculable probability. I am not fit to actually even tell you what that is. Okay? So it's these kinds of observations that allow us to then make conclusions about the relatedness of species. Right? Because then we can track these changes throughout different species and understand which species is more related to another species. Okay? And those, uh, you know, th those types of calculations are critical for the field of population genetics and evolutionary genetics. Right? And all of that would go to shambles. All of those conclusions would be obliterated because the, you know, this new theory would then suggest that this incredibly low probability event where 10,000 viruses integrated were truncated by human and chimp cells identically at the identical location of the viral sequence and then integrated into the chimpanzee and human sequence at the same exact position, and that was done tens of thousands of times, would become the order of the day, right? And that would obliterate pretty much every assumption that we make in evolutionary genetics. That's one example. Um. I'm having trouble understanding how you correlate the miracle of life to religion. I agree the chance of life occurring is incredibly small, yet this doesn't show to me any empirical evidence that religion is the answer to this small chance. More specifically, Christianity or any faith that directly combats Christianity's claims. What do you consider as evidence, whether based scientifically or on faith, to support Christianity's definition of what it means to be human? You've used the Bible to relate how science already explains evolutionary theory. So besides the Bible or intelligent design, uh, which can be used to explain other religions, what other evidence is there in your eyes to support Christianity on defining what it means to be human? On defining the uniqueness of a human? Yes. Okay, so that's fair, right? Because what I do in my talk is talk about some of the limitations that are inherent to biology, mm -hmm. right? What it teaches us, but what, how it doesn't fully get us there. And then I just make this seismic shift and talk about how, as a Christian, what, what does my faith have to tell me about this, right? Mm -hmm. But it's an extremely fair question to ask, why should I care what your faith has to tell you about this, <laughs> right? So my answer to that is it's actually backdoor. There's nothing about, for me it's not, um, and there may be others with different experiences that I would like to respect, but for me, coming to the Christian faith has absolutely nothing to do with trying to explain the miracle of life, right? Um, there are always competing models. Now I might be able to make the argument that perhaps if you keep going back and back and back, what is the agency that started all of this, okay? It can be a compelling argument sometimes for some people, um, but then you get into the argument of multiverses, okay, but then what created those multiverses, right? Um, so there is an argument to be made for the veracity of God, but ultimately I don't think that's a provable concept, and I'm never gonna act like it is, okay? Mm -hmm. For me, it's actually coming at it through the back door. For me, it's the person of Christ that was really compelling to me. And I, in, in studying the person of Christ, when I was in college at Cornell, I sort of set up a kind of comparative religion course for myself. And I studied a lot of the major traditions, uh, faith traditions of the world. And um, I found many of them, and still to this day, find many of them very beautiful and in some ways very compelling. But what stood out to me in Christianity was the person of Christ, right? It wasn't, I mean, the golden rule, there are derivations of that in other faith traditions, right? It's not that that compelled me to, yes, then there's a God, mm -hmm. right? It was the person of Christ and how everything he said and did was completely countercultural, right? Um, there he was, the protagonist of the story, hanging naked, pathetic on a cross. It wasn't something that I could really compute and understand, right? I wanted you know, a valiant warrior Muhammad. I wanted a, a Krishna that became 60 feet tall when he was challenged. These were things I could relate with. These were things I could resonate with. Here was this pathetic character on a cross, and the first two times I read the gospel accounts, I couldn't even get through it. But what I learned over time in studying what he had to say is that he was disabusing me of my notions of power, right? We usually use power to, uh, you know, enforce our kind of superiority, often by force on others. But here was this guy saying, this is my power, and by the way, you're gonna see it in a couple of days in all its glory, but this is what I choose to do with my power. I lay it all down completely for the sake of others. So I'm mentioning all of this because it was the personhood, the actual person of Christ that drew me in, that then made me want to 
uh, um, uh, study and, and, and interrogate the veracity of the claims of Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. One of the really interesting things about Christianity is it's completely falsifiable, right? There are so many historical claims that it makes, right, that you could attempt to falsify those claims, right? It makes it very easy as opposed to some other faith traditions, um, particularly much older ones, right, where it's difficult to falsify, right? Either you believe it or you don't or whatever, you know. And so it provided an opportunity for me to actually to, to study the, the, the literature that was there to see if it was plausible and believable, to take a historical archeological perspective to this. I tried to apply as much as my faculties as I could to understanding and interrogating the veracity of the claims. And it was actually that process that ultimately led me to think that this was a very reliable piece of text, okay? Um, and it's only after the entrance into that space where I'm convinced, I think that there's reliability to this text, I think it can hold up to scrutiny, that I am then able to say, okay, what does it have to say about you know, this X, Y, and Z question, right? Um, and so very honestly, that, that's my trajectory with this. Mm -hmm. And so someone who isn't a Christian, I don't expect that that part of my answer is going to appeal to them necessarily, except of course to say, okay, what, what are my honest thoughts? Have I read it and what are my honest thoughts about it? Do I think it's also uh, you know, verifiable or whatnot, right? But that's my honest answer to the question. I hope that helped. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering like your opinion on this. So like when there's actual conflict between like religion and science, like the like two, two things don't match up, like they're kind of, you can't uh, compromise them. Like what do you think of that? Like my opinion is like when the two are in conflict, more than likely, well, I would go with like the scientific thought, but what, what's your opinion? So in, this is what I was hoping to uh, articulate in my talk is that oftentimes when they are pitted one against the other um, and perceived to be in conflict, that might be because of an improper understanding of one or both, right? Um, I tried to make the case today that in some areas of perceived conflict, it's really a, perhaps an incomplete, even improper understanding of both, right? So I think that's, that we need to start there because um, your propensity that you share to maybe go with the scientific one, I think that uh, uh, there is a tendency to do that because somehow we think that there's greater truth to be found there, right, than in the text of uh, Christian scripture, for example, right? So I think we actually first need to start with, are we, interpreting what these things say correctly, both the data, right, and the resulting scientific conclusions, and the scripture and the resulting theology. I think we have to do the work, especially showing the example of John Calvin who said, well, maybe we were a little too uptight about what the firmament was. Because now I go back and I realize it doesn't really matter exactly how we think about the firmament. That wasn't really the point, right? So oftentimes we, do, we, we need to be careful, right? There's this notion of concordism, right, where you take the newest, latest, greatest scientific uh, finding and uh, then somehow try to squeeze theology into that. And I think we need, we need to avoid that, but there are times where science can sometimes illuminate where maybe we are holding to positions that the Bible doesn't demand, right? And, uh, and, and they can talk to each other in that way. Um, so I just had some questions specifically. You said earlier that like the purpose or maybe the meaning of like humanity is to find joy in God's creation. So I was reading like Genesis chapter five and it talks about just the lifespan of like Methuselah, Adam, Enoch, people like that. And they're living to be 800, 900 years. Um, and I guess at this point, if you treat them as actual historical figures, so what leads from the downfall of their lives? Like why would God author our evolution to become shorter instead of longer to live longer in the joy of his creation? Mm. Uh, what, why, would he, why would he allow for our lifespan to be shorter or evolution to be shorter? No, no, no. So if God, offer, if God authors our evolution, why yeah. would he allow for our lifespan to be shorter instead of live longer and live longer in the joy of his creation? Okay, yeah. So you're linking changes in our lifespan to evolutionary processes, which may not necessarily be the case, yeah. right? So evolution, uh, thought about as most scientists think about it, biological evolution, speciation, it happens on the orders of tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years, right? Um, and so, you know, even thinking about 
most of recorded human history, that's not really that chunk of a time for serious kind of uh, massive evolutionary changes to occur, right? So it's very long, slow process interacting with changes in the environment, right? So perhaps there have been changes in lifespan if we do take that at face value. Um, but I, I, I'd be hesitant to say that that had something to do with an evolutionary process as much as it did with just perhaps the way that we uh, grew as a human species, right? The things that we did to one another, the toxicity of our environment perhaps. I'm not really sure, I don't have the answers. Um, but there are probably more local answers to that question if indeed we do interpret it as a shortening of lifespan. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay, um, so I was kind of just curious about the, the converse of what you were saying. And so just to give an example, uh, Darwin publishes um, his main thing on the origin of species in 1859 and it doesn't take until I think 100 years later in the 1950s when Pope Pius XII eventually says that theological evolution is okay and those two can be reconciled with each other. And as we progress as a human species, I think that we're bound to discover more about what makes us human mm -hmm. and where we come from. And so rather than always having to reconcile religion with science as if it's something that weakens our religion, do you think that science can actually strengthen religion? Because for me personally, when I read about evolution and Genesis, rather than immediately jump into a conflict, I see a purpose in how something can happen. And so do you think that science can explain religion rather than always be the converse of it? Oh my gosh, absolutely. You should have given the talk today, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. That's, it's, it's not that I'm here just to say, okay guys, they, they're, they're not disharmonious. I'm actually trying to say that they're harmonious, right? And when you think about what harmony actually means, right? It's like these two threads in a musical arrangement that are kind of, they're different. They're totally different if you listen to them separately, right? But they're really beautiful together, right? And it's what really makes it. Um, and sometimes they, they seem to kind of play off of one another too, right? And so I think that's the way that we ought to really think about it. I think the word harmony is being applied to science and faith in a very thoughtful way here. Um, and it can actually, um, uh, uh, I think enrich our understanding of spiritual things, not necessarily just not fight within them, right? That, and that's sort of what I was alluding to with Kepler and some of those guys. They were driven to do science and uh, you know celebrate their scientific discoveries, but it wasn't like they just, he was a religious guy and he somehow just hoped that they would be harmonious and everything would be okay. He was actually driven to uh, do that science and then interpret that science in the light of his faith, right? So. I agree. So um, this could kind of go along with the last question, but um, in Genesis, it talks about like on the first day, on the second day and stuff. And um, I've heard that the original translation in Hebrew, day doesn't like only mean 24 hours, that it could mean like a period of time. <coughs> so do you know anything about that or like if like the world is so old, like if a day was different, like I, don't, I was just wondering if you knew anything about that. Yeah, I think that probably it does mean 24 hours, okay? But it's just not in a, um, not, not, it's not meant, the entire piece is not meant to be, um, you know, uh, a, a literal ex exposition of how God physically made the material world. Right? but that there's actually something much, much deeper going on as far as the purpose of that story. Because I don't think, again, we need to think about it um, the way that the readers of that time would have read it. Right? And they weren't retrojecting to the text the conflict that we're going to be having thousands of years later about people thinking about young earth creation and old earth creation and things like that. Right? So this notion really became popular of maybe interpreting day as something longer with an old earth creationist movement. Right? where the data for an old earth became so uh, uh, compelling and convincing to some people um, that this was an accommodation, a way to kind of still somehow work Genesis 1 into a framework that could allow them to accept old earth. And I'm really hesitant about those kinds of accommodations. Right? I wanna take the text and be as faithful with it as I possibly can. Right? So my reading of it is not in as much as I can control, I don't know if there are uh, you know, unknown biases that creep in, but I'm not like actively looking for confirmations of evolution or old earth or anything like that because it's simply not a scientific text for me. I'm looking for truth that's far deeper than that. 
Right? Yeah. So prob my best estimation is that it probably doesn't really mean period, um, uh, but that the whole point of that text is actually quite different than something um, that has to do with uh, you know, a, what he did physically in 24 hours. So I really appreciate the fact of you bringing up the Imago Dei and the image of God as being just like central to who we are as human beings, who we are as followers of Christ. Um, one question that comes out of that, though, for me, as being kind of a, or the core, an almost exclusive definition of humanity, being what does that then say about Jesus taking on human likeness? with that definition, what does it mean for you to say Jesus took on human likeness? I think it's a great question. And in fact, I think scripture deals with it directly by calling him the image of the invisible God, right? So I think what it means at the end of the day is that he is our pattern, right? We look to him. If we have question about we're supposed to ref represent God and reflect God, how do we do that? We look to him because he took on human likeness and scripture refers to him as the image of the invisible God, right? So he is our pattern for how we image God, right? So we look to him for what his character was like and emulate that. I think that that's essentially how we interpret him taking on human likeness. Is it an oxymoron to say that our definition of being human is to have the image of God? Jesus is God, he took on the image of God and therefore he's human? No, because I think that, you know, he does, this gets into pretty deep things about how to think about uh, um, you know, um, Jesus in the human form, okay? We could probably be here all night talking about that. But, I, you know, he, he does release some of his powers and come in the form of a human being and basically exemplify what it looks like to live out of complete trust, right? He's tempted too. He just doesn't give in to that temptation, right? So I feel like what he's doing is setting a pattern for how we ought to behave. Even the baptism, does it make any sense that Jesus should be baptized? But I think it's setting a pattern for what our behavior of submission should look like, you know? So th that's what I think ultimately a lot of those three years are about. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm a neuroscience major, so this question's uh, very special to me. It's one <laughs> I wrestle with all the time. <laughs> So growing up in church, um, like you, you learn uh, that you know the soul uh, and who you are is, like who you are is biological, but also you know as you said you know like it's something more than that. There's you know you have a, a soul, and when you die, you know we we go to be with Jesus. And I was just wondering, um, uh, have you ever thought through uh, how the soul and the human brain uh, is integrated, uh, particularly with you know a lot of rising knowledge about neuroscience and how our brains work? Um, I was wondering if you'd ever thought through a lot of questions like that. Yeah, I, I do think through it without very much uh, fruit. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, you know, I don't believe that this thing that we've been talking about, whatever we want to call it, that kind of separates us, that makes us look upward, that gives us this calling or this desire to represent and reflect him. I don't think that's really materially encoded somewhere, right? But I do agree with you that um, neuroscience is the next frontier you know, for a question, the, the science-faith intersection, right? The way that genetics and genomics have been for a little while, particularly with the evolution debate and things like that. Um, I think questions of free will, right? Um, with more and more work being done in neuroscience is really the next frontier. And I'm excited by that. I think as Christians, we should be not fearful, but excited. What is this going to reveal that we didn't know before? And how is that going to help us understand the mind of God better? So I don't have answers yet, but maybe if I come back to Blacksburg in 10 years, we'll be able to, to say more about it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, again, I'd like to join those that thank you for your presentation tonight, and thanks for uh, being, willing, being willing to take questions from such a huge range of things yeah. you didn't actually talk about in your main part tonight. Um, I but, invited it, so it's my fault. <laughs> you did. You totally invited it. Yeah. So to get back to Adam and Eve, the historical Adam and Eve, you put forward two models that explain maybe you could call it a federal model that there was yep. two people, two individuals, and somehow their actions uh, were applied to all of the humans at that time. I'm personally comfortable with that model. I'm not really comfortable with the other model, 
because it seems like so much of New Testament theology is based on the assumption of a historical Adam and Eve. And I appreciate the, the sensitivity with which you approach the, how do we understand scripture and how do we understand it when it appears to touch on scientific things. But I think we have to um, be honest as well as scientists that we get it wrong sometimes. Yes. So I'm just wondering if you could share with us some examples of how scientists have really got it wrong. Oh, there are lots and lots of, so, uh, you know, I don't, don't personally think evolution is one of them. So if you look at the trajectory of, of uh, the way that scientists have viewed biological evolution, this was not some sort of, yay, Darwin, you know, after the origin of species was written. It was, it was a lot of tension um, with uh, scientists not really fully embracing what Darwin had to say, and it took time for that theory to really set itself in the scientific community. And so it's really intriguing to study that history, actually. So uh, scientists are skeptical by nature. Right? So any new theory, man, the burden of proof is really on you to then penetrate that community to start to think that it's viable. And, and he really went through the ringer to try to keep his ideas afloat. And of course, Darwin was completely, he wasn't privy to the idea of DNA. He didn't understand the mechanisms for how what he was proposing would happen. So there was still so much to uncover. But as we uncovered those things, and we tested and tested and tested, we began to see how his model could make sense, right? And he got things wrong. And that's why I'm bringing this whole thing up to answer right. your other question. He got a number of things wrong, right? He mused at times whether you could have a Lamarckian uh, uh, type of uh, mechanism going on, right? So he was open to it. And, and we don't really subscribe to those views now in modern science. And so um, it's not that he got everything right. It's that there was a core of what he was trying to say that was illuminating for us and that we ran with, right? So scientists get things wrong all the time. Um, I'm struggling to think of a case where, you know, scripture said something about science, science said something else, and then we learned science got it wrong. Big I, Bang. What's that? Big Bang. Why is scripture, so I'm not sure. So scripture was right about that. Mm -hmm. Right, that mm -hmm. in the beginning God created the world, but mm -hmm. for thousands of years, including uh, the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. even the, the idea was the universe was eternal. Mm -hmm. And that really came from Aristotelian theology, mm -hmm. a philosophy, excuse me. Yeah. So that would be an example where scripture was right, science was wrong when the Big Bang was first proposed in 1923. Yes. There was tremendous opposition to it. So I would agree with that, except that there are a lot of communities that don't like to interpret Genesis 1 as Big Bang, right? So it depends on what Christian community you're talking to <laughs> in terms of interpretation of scripture. Sure, but I'm it's just not as uniform. A non-eternal universe was where sure. scripture was right, science was wrong sure. for thousands of years. Sure, yep. yep. It had a beginning. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Okay, so from an academic perspective or like from the perspective of someone who does not believe in supernatural forces, how would they explain something like a miraculous healing that seems to defy like biological possibility, but how would you explain that without arguing that it doesn't happen? Um. You, you like a specific instance, or you're saying generally speaking, when people talk of miracles, like a healing, how can you explain that in any way outside of a supernatural intervention? If a specific instance would be easier to use, feel free, but I was thinking general. Okay, yeah, thanks for that question. I, I honestly, my honest answer is that I don't wrestle with that that much, and, and here's why. There have been a lot of times where we ascribed certain phenomena to supernatural things and then ended up finding natural causes for it. That doesn't remove God out of the equation for me as a believer, right? God is an author of natural processes just as much as he is of supernatural processes. And this came up in, uh, over dinner uh, with Mike. But to me, it's not any more special when God does something supernaturally, when he defies the laws that he set up to accomplish something I, I don't really view that as any more special um, or any more godish, right, than uh, you know, understanding the natural causes that he set up and authored to accomplish something. And in fact, as a scientist, I get to study those natural processes and I realize just how wonderfully, beautifully complex they are. It's an opportunity for me to worship, you know, just the way that one might consider doing when you witness a miraculous event. And so um, I often don't know. I often don't know. Was that a, was, could we end up finding an explanation for that biologically? Maybe, maybe not. Wouldn't make it any less God to me, and that's the way that I deal with it. 
So um, we have uh, th this evening had an opportunity to be informed, perhaps inspired and uh, challenged to think of things in a different way. And so um, I appreciate the fact that you came down from, uh, from Cornell University and we just ask you all to express your appreciation for Dr. Praveen's talk tonight. Dr. S <clears throat> Dr. Sethapathy will be down here on the, uh, the floor at the uh, bottom of the auditorium if you'd like to interact with him more. We thank you very much for coming tonight and have a good night. Thank, thank you. Thank you for coming.